Welcome to your flipped classroom chemistry. Uh, what we're going to be doing is I'd like to maybe try chapter number five in this flipped classroom format. Uh, section number one, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be talking about electrons in these atoms and specifically light and quantized energy. Basically what we're going to be doing is we're going to be focusing on just the electrons in this chapter and the reason why we're focusing on the electrons is because we're going to find out that the electrons move around. The nucleus, your protons, neutrons, what's in the middle stays in the middle. Nothing gets in, nothing gets out. If you remember Rutherford's model of the atom, okay, again when we were looking at his model of the atom, basically his model had the nucleus here and had those electrons on the outside. Okay? And again, the problem with his model, okay, there were problems that existed. First thing is, uh, his model lacked detail of how the electrons were arranged. If you think back to that picture I had on the board, yes, we did have the protons in the middle. But the problem was, yeah, there are electrons, but specifically, where are they at around that nucleus? Are they all in one ring? We know right now there are seven rings. Uh, were they moving three-dimensionally? Were they moving two-dimensionally? So again, his map lacked a lot of detail about those electrons. His model of the atom also could not explain why the electrons were not pulled into the atom's positively charged nucleus. Again, we know positives and negatives want to attract one another. But when you looked at his model, again, he couldn't explain what would really cause that atom to implode if they did literally attract one another. <coughs> and finally, his model of the atom couldn't explain the differences in the chemical behavior of those elements. We have 114 different elements on the periodic table, but what made hydrogen different than oxygen? What made both of those gases different from calcium, that is a soft silvery metal? In the early 1900s, certain elements were found to emit visible light when placed in a flame test. Uh, some elements are going to produce orange color, some are going to produce green, some are kind of the blues. Think of a fireworks show. Okay? Again, you've got all of these fireworks going off and you've got these beautiful colors that are being emitted. But again, certain elements emitted different amounts or different colors of visible light. And this allowed scientists to conclude or begin to think that light... Uh, given off was going to act like a wave. So this color difference was going to have a wave-like behavior. What they said, all of this uh, light that these elements were giving off was going to be electromagnetic radiation. Electromagnetic radiation is just a form of energy, okay, that's where the light comes in, that exhibits wave-like behavior. So the lights uh, light color that is given off by the fireworks. Again, it was going to have wave-like characteristics. And more specifically, it acted like a transverse wave. And again, when you look at this transverse wave going up and down, kind of like ripples of water, again, we have some characteristics here. High point on a wave to high point on a wave, wavelength. Also, you could also look at the low point to low point. That also will be wavelength. Highest point, I know they call it peaks, I'd like you to know it as crests, okay, so again, I'm not going to have you know that one there. We're going to look at the high points as crests, okay, so the high point on a transverse wave is going to be your crest. Low points, low points are your troughs, and then the last one, from your rest position or middle to the highest point, or rest position to lowest points. Because these waves are symmetrical, we're going to say that's the amplitude. And amplitude is going to represent the amount of energy in a wave. Looking at a little vocabulary, uh, amplitude, like I said, that is the amount of energy a wave has. Uh, think of going to the uh, beach or to the ocean. A wave that hits you shin high is going to be a lot less or have a lot less energy than one that comes in and hits you about shoulder high. One hits you shoulder high, it's going to probably knock you over. <coughs> Wavelength, like I kind of identified, going from crest of one to crest of another uh, is going to be your wavelength. So it's dif distance from one point on a wave to an identical point on the next wave. You can literally go, if you want, rest position to rest position. You can go from low point 
to low point. So I could go from there to there. I could go from there to there. And again, because this is symmetrical, these distances are going to be identical. So that's your wavelength. And then the last one is frequency. And that one's going to be more of a timing thing. If I start a stopwatch and I say, okay, one wave, two waves, three waves, four waves, what we're doing is we're counting how many waves are going to pass a point in one second. Okay? So again, if you hear something of 25 hertz, what we're saying is it's 20 watt, 25 waves uh, per one second of time. The other thing that they knew about electromagnetic radiation or electromagnetic waves was they all moved at the speed of light. I don't take care if we're talking about x-rays, microwaves, gamma waves, anything like that. Anything that was electromagnetic waves moved at the speed of light. There's going to be your symbol for the speed of light. 3.0 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. So what they were able to conclude was the speed of light is equal to the wavelength multiplied by the frequency. Looking here, wavelength, and again it's going to be measured in meters. Frequency. Frequency is going to be measured in hertz. Now, what is a hertz? Hertz, really it's a wave per second. So when I say 25 hertz, we can say 25 waves per second. Or, again, notice where seconds is at. Seconds is in the denominator. So we can also say it's 25 uh, seconds to the negative 1 power. What scientists were able to conclude was, remember what we said, the speed of light is equal to the wavelength times the frequency. If the speed of light was a constant, guess what? These two had to be indirectly related to one another. As one goes up, one goes down to keep that, see, to keep that same 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. If we go ahead and look at an example problem, we're going to be talking about microwaves here. It says microwaves are used to transmit information. Question says, what is the wavelength? Okay, right there. Important. What is the wavelength of a microwave that has a frequency of 3.44 times 10 to the 9th hertz? So when I go ahead and I look at my equation, I say wavelength is equal to speed of light divided by frequency. Now, again, I know a lot of you sometimes like that circle equation. So if you want, we can go ahead and set it up like that. Speed of light is equal to wavelength multiplied by frequency. So when we go ahead and want to solve for wavelength, we're going to take the speed of light, divide it by the frequency. So by doing that, we're going to take the speed of light, 3.00 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. We're going to divide it by 3.44 times 10 to the 9th. And when I plug that through my calculator, uh, I get 0 .0872 meters. Again, when you're using your calculator, I'd like you using that double E button. Uh, again, when you sometimes type it in as 10 times 10 raised to the ninth power, if you don't use parentheses, you're going to get yourself in a little bit of trouble, okay, with some problem or with some errors in answers you might get. <clears throat> the problem, though, was scientists thought that the color of light that was given off by an element was due to the amount of energy that object had gained. And what I mean by that is when you think of a piece of iron, a piece of iron at room temperature is going to be just kind of a grayish metal. When I begin to heat it up, it turns red. And if I get it extremely hot, it's bluish in color. So remember what I said. Sodium is going to give off an orangish color. Well, how can you say that an element has three different colors? And that's something that couldn't be or couldn't completely be explained. Well, what Max Planck looked at was he realized that the wave model could not explain those emission of the different colors at different temperatures. Because again, if you say a fireworks goes up and it gives off a bluish color, that element that's in that compound is always going to give off a bluish color. How can we go from gray to red to blue and have three different colors at different amounts or at different temperatures? So what Max Planck basically said was, you know what? That wave-like characteristics can't be true. So what he proposed was this idea of quantum. Quantum was the minimum amount of energy that can be gained or lost. Notice what we're saying. It's not waves anymore. It's now energy. Okay? He was looking at different amounts of energy. 
room temperature has less energy than just say kind of an orangish red flame. All of a sudden when you get a really hot flame, it turns that blue in color. And again, that blue in color is going to kind of be passed on. So he said that it's not waves, it has more to do with the energy that has been gained or lost. So what he did is he said we need to calculate that amount of energy in a substance that is needed to give off those different colors. What he said was quantum energy, E is energy, but quantum energy is equal to some constant multiplied by frequency. Okay? Quantum energy in joules. Okay, so energy is going to be measured in joules. Again, V. V is still frequency like we just talked about before, and it is still going to be measured in hertz. And what he did is he came up with this Planck's constant. And Planck's constant is just going to be 6.62 times 10 to the negative 34th. I think your book might say 6.626. Uh, times 10 to the negative 34th joules seconds. And what we're saying is according to Planck, there were only certain multiples of energy. And what I'd like to do is I'd basically like to say it's like a stair step. Okay? I'm here. I'm at ground level. I'm at my lowest energy state. Well, guess what? When I step up here on this chair, I'm at a higher energy state. Now, the thing is, I can't be in between levels. You know, even if I do this, well, look where my top foot is. It's on the chair, okay? Even though this foot's down here, I'm at this level right here. If I step up onto a desk, again, I'm at a higher energy level. I'm either here, here, or I'm here. You can't be in between levels, okay? You're here or you're here. And the thing is, electrons either gained or lost that energy. If they gained energy, they had to gain enough to jump up here. When they lost, they had to lose enough energy to fall down here. So it's certain stair steps. You can't be in between steps. You're either here, or you're here, or you're up here. There is no in between for this quantum energy. Albert Einstein, kind of heard from him, from uh, Mr. Randy Nadler, as we were talking, uh, had a lot to do with this. He looked at the wave-like characteristics that scientists talked about. He looked at this energy that Planck talked about. And the thing was, he found out that it is not a wave-like characteristic. It is not quantum energy. And he came up with his idea of photons. And the thing was, they actually both were correct. A photon is a particle of electromagnetic radiation. So it really did have those wave-like characteristics. But the thing is, these photons don't have a mass, but they carried quantums of energy. So, like I said, the individuals who said that it was a wave-like characteristic, they were correct. Planck, he was correct. But it took Einstein to put both of them together to come up with this idea of a photon. Einstein, he modified Planck's equation to look like. Now, instead of quantum energy, it's photon energy. Photon energy is equal to Planck's constant, as before, multiplied by the frequency. So it's the energy of a photon in joules. We have Planck's constant, that's 6.62 times 10 to the negative 34th joules seconds, and frequency in hertz. Now, the one thing that is unique about each and every human being on the face of the earth is every single person has their own set of fingerprints. Same thing really can be said about the elements. Every element and every compound will emit or absorb certain frequencies of light. And it's very similar to our fingerprints. No two elements will have the same exact emission or absorption of light. No two compounds will have the same absorption or emission of light. So the thing is, they're very unique, just like each and every human being. There's two types of electromagnetic spectrums. The first, first one is going to be an emission spectrum. Think of the word emit. When you emit, you give off. So what it is, is it's a completely black spectrum 
with certain colors given off along the way. Think of your rainbow, Roy G. Biv, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Sorry, I almost lost my train of thought for a second. So Roy G. Biv. So you have this complete spectrum. Maybe there's a couple of red lines here. Maybe there's a yellow line. Maybe there's about three blue lines here. For a certain element, that's its fingerprints. Okay? And that element will always have those fingerprints. And your other one is going to be an absorption spectrum. Your absorption spectrum, this is going to be the complete rainbow. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Complete rainbow. You see the colored spectrum. But all of a sudden, maybe a red line is gone. Now maybe I have a couple of orange lines gone. Maybe I have two blue lines gone. And maybe I have two violet lines gone. Okay? Notice what I said. They're gone. They're absorbing those colors. So it's the colored spectrum with certain colors that are being absorbed. Okay? Here again, we're going to take light. Here's your rainbow right here. Okay? Roy G. Biv. Let me go ahead and, and get rid of that. Okay? Here's all of your colors. White light is your rainbow made up of all of the colors. Okay? Here's an emission spectrum. Okay? Maybe not your best here, but again, this is completely black. Notice I have one colored line there. I have a colored line there. I have a couple of lines there, lines line there, and then a couple of lines out there. Notice, same gas. Okay, or not notice, but I'm going to tell you, same gas. Here is your absorption spectrum. Okay, here's the complete rainbow, just as you saw up here. But notice, there's a black line. There's a black line. There's two black lines. There's a black line. These colors right in here, at there, 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 those frequencies, they're being absorbed. They're being taken in. But here's the thing. I told you earlier, I said this is the same gas. One is emission, one is absorption. If I bring these two together, that line will fill in that spot. These two lines will fill in those two spots. This line will fill in that spot. This line will fill in those two spots. The emission and absorption spectrum, this is for a certain element. They are like this for each and every element or compound. Each one will have its own fingerprints. You know, I don't know what this is. Let's say it's hydrogen. Hydrogen will always be this way. If this is hydrogen and it's an absorption spectrum, it will always be absorbed those ways.